before we dive into talking about engaging students during the remote teaching period, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the South African context and the challenges of, of moving so rapidly to remote teaching and learning. Remote teaching in South Africa is far from an ideal solution, especially for traditionally face-to-face -face institutions. We will have to anticipate a range of problems, accessing remote learning spaces, adapting our practices and creating accommodations for the diversity of students and staff facing this task. However, at this point, remote teaching is the situation that we find ourselves in. UCT students are officially on holiday until the 20th of April and Term 2 will run remotely. While we are hoping to be back into the face-to-face -face mode at the beginning of the second semester, we live in uncertain times. We will need to adjust and make accommodations and offer special dispensations given the changing circumstances around us. And above all, we will need to care for the people around us. Our principle, moving into this difficult time, is that we are working from a place of uncertainty. The ground under our feet may shift at any moment, and we cannot grow too attached to any single response. In short, we will need to exercise empathy and kindness and compassion with others and with ourselves, because any response will have consequences. On the screen in front of you, you're going to see some of the possible responses that universities across the world have adopted. The first is a kind of social distancing with semi-remote learning. The second is student closure with remote learning. And the final is a kind of full closure. At the moment, UCT is in the kind of student closure model, with remote learning for students and staff also being um, working from off campus. We can expect that the impact of corona of the coronavirus and COVID virus will linger and that we will need to be ready for further accommodations related to access issues, mental health issues, and physical health issues. However, the full shutdown and complete reorganization of the academic year poses a substantial disruption to teaching and learning and will necessitate a shift in term dates. In the, in the DVC desk date of the 19th of March, the DVC for Teaching and Learning made very clear that it was critical to remember that students in the South African context have different levels of access to the internet and technology, and that many of our students will be studying in contexts where it is very difficult for them to study. So taking this into account, UCT has opted to go with a low-tech remote teaching option. We'll talk a bit more about what that means in relation to communication and community shortly. The institution is in the process of negotiating zero-rated mobile data through University of South Africa with the various cell phone providers. Additionally, there is a vulnerable work, uh, a working group for vulnerable students, which will aim to reduce obstacles to learning for these students, and they will be producing a plan of support shortly. Finally, provision for contact catch-up time will be made if necessary. So by now, you will be familiar with the image in front of you. We've talked so far already in the first two webinars about content and activities in a remote teaching context. And what we're looking at now is the idea of communication and community. So how is it that in the remote teaching context, we might consider building communication and community for our students. But before you think about communication and building a sense of community in a remote space, it's a very good idea to focus on what you already have in your course schedule. In previous sessions, you've thought about listing the content that you present to students and the particular kinds of learning activities that students undertake. If you haven't done this so far, it's a really useful planning activity and we strongly suggest you do it soon. At this point though, you can begin to figure out how you usually build a sense of communication and community in your classroom. 
and how you might do this in the sense of remote learning. We take face-to-face -face communication for granted. It feels easy, but it relies, even when it's successful, on embedded behaviors and expectations. We know, and our students know, to be in a lecture or a tut, but when we move into the remote context, everything changes. Communication with students online needs to be frequent, intentional, and multifaceted. In our remote teaching context, you will need to make meaningful connections with your students with a carefully chosen selection of tools that are available to you. So the table in front of you is an opportunity for you to think about how you might conventionally communicate with your students. Most often that means sending emails irregularly when the need strikes because we can back that up with things like classroom conversations or classroom announcements. We might also encourage, in the normal context, our tutors to do certain kinds of communication work with our students about the course. Or we might use something like the Vula calendar. Whatever your particular communication and community building activities are, before you start thinking about how to move these into a remote space, Take a moment and think a little bit about what they currently are. So it will be clear to you that communication is key, especially in the online context. As you begin to plan for communication in this context, you need to start thinking about what your communication needs are in relation to, one, the facilitation of student learning, two, as a presenter of student learning, three, as a manager of student learning, and four, as an assessor of student learning. How will you communicate with your students when you're expecting them to learn, and what you're expecting them to learn, and when assessments, in whatever form they may take, will be? It's also useful to kind of flip the perspective and think about what students' communication needs are. So for example, how will your students access course information? Do you have a course outline on your Vula site that students can see easily? How will they communicate with their students and tutors? It's worth setting up a clear line of communication with you and your tutors. In the long run, it is likely to ensure that fewer people are disappointed or have expectations that cannot be met. Have you thought about communication in relation to learning among peer groups and students? This might mean setting up forums and groups, such as tutorial groups, or alternatively, it might mean grouping students in WhatsApp groups with the tutor in charge. Try out a tool like Hypothesis, for example, to get students informally chatting about a document. Finally, have you created or checked that students have access to spaces for informal student interaction with their peers? There are actually plenty of exciting options for this. So in addition to Vula, consider something like WhatsApp groups or a channel on MS Teams. But if your goal is to create a space where communication and community continue to develop, you will need to think about these four spaces for your students' communication needs. In the current context, with all the pressures on us, it's very, very easy to get bogged down in the idea of content, getting my content online. But Paul Delinson reminds us that getting your content online is not your priority. Maintaining connection with your students is. So let's talk about communication and community building in terms of this concept of synchronous and asynchronous communication. Synchronous communication is communication that happens in real time, simultaneously, as if you and I were having a conversation right now. Asynchronous communication, on the other hand, is communication which is distributed about time uh, or through time. So for example, recording something and putting it online for students to watch is an act of asynchronous communication. Synchronous communication in the South African context poses challenges. We cannot assume that all of our students will be available at the time we would like them to be. They may have home responsibilities. They may need to nurse 
ill family members. They may need to look after younger brothers or sisters while mom and dad are out the house. Um, in the South African context, additionally, many of our students will experience infrastructure challenges. For example, load shedding or data shortages and will find themselves in a position where perhaps they work late at night uh, in order to make sure that their data goes as far as possible. So synchronous communication is a problem. Just a reminder though that these various kinds of uh, tools are available to you. So for synchronous communication, you could look at a course WhatsApp group, office hours using Vula chat or a WhatsApp group, a chat in the Vula um, LMS, or Zoom webinars. For asynchronous communication, you've got options like blogs or forums, the question and answer tool in Vula, polls, and of course emails, which we're all very familiar with. So let's talk a little bit about some of these tools. We're going to start with some uh, with the idea of asynchronous tools, and we're going to start with blogs. So blogs are largely used to share experiences, insights, and reflections by a single author. In order to get the most out of blogs in terms of student learning and building, con um, building connection, you have to have a plan for how you're going to get students to write those blogs and then how they're going to engage with each other's blogs. You'll need to help them set up their blogs, advise them how often to blog, establish guidelines for the comment process, indicate the topic of the blog and how long it should be, and so on. You can give students very clear directions on what to blog about, or you can kind of leave it open to them. So you could alternate between asking students to reflect on their learning in a course, and then giving them something very conceptual to deal with. A critical part of the blogging experience is that there must be some form of response to a blog. This can take various forms. Either you can respond to blogs, your students can respond to each other's blogs, or you can get your tutors to respond to their tutor group blogs. So think about blogging as a way of building conversation in your community. Another asynchronous tool that's very useful is the idea of polls. So if blogging is an opportunity for a person to speak at length about their views, Polls are a quick snapshot about how a group of students feels about a particular issue. You can use it for logistical matters, like what time to hold your office hours, or you can use it for teaching and learning matters. So polls can get your students to give you quick feedback about specific conceptual issues. Uh, what are the particular aspects of a course that they're struggling with? Um, which case do they do they think most represents a particular theoretical position, and so on. The key thing is to inform your students why you're going to use a poll, and then to use the most accessible language you can for the poll options. And then follow up on the poll output. In other words, recognize it in some kind of way. So here's another asynchronous tool for you, forums. Forums are a digital version of an organized discussion. So what forums allow us to do is to nominate a particular topic and having nominated a particular topic to provide structure to the discussion that follows. Instead of saying to students, what do you think about X? A forum might guide students through two or three or four separate questions that allow them to develop an opinion on X. In Vula, each forum is a kind of container for a particular topic and discussion, and each topic then contains a thread of conversation. In addition to setting up the topic and the questions for the forums, you're going to need to provide guidance as to how one might engage in a forum. Just like with blogging, your presence is critical for signaling the importance of participation and you will need to moderate or steer the discussion and acknowledge student comments. A really useful learning tool in forums is forum summaries. You could do this, but it might be very helpful to ask students or possibly even tutors to do this. And in the same way that, for example, you would give 
possibly a mark for class participation in a tutorial group, you can do something um, very similar in a forum space by encouraging students to participate and then giving them a participation mark. Another tool that allows us to communicate with our student community and them to communicate with us is the questions and answers tool in Vula. Um, the questions and answers, answers tool allows either for the identification or anonymity of participants, but it allows students to ask you questions that they would like answered. So you can moderate the student questions before making them publicly available in the course site and before responding to them. You can also get students to respond to each other's questions, or you can respond directly by email if it's not anonymous and you think that's appropriate. You can also take frequently asked questions, like what's happening with assessment, and turn that into an FAQ. And then instead of having to repeat yourself multiple times, you can just encourage students to go and look at the answer, what's happening with assessment, in your FAQ section. So questions and answers is a way of, of kind of swapping the direction. Instead of you questioning students, gives them an opportunity to ask you questions. So a critical principle in all of this is really to think about humanizing the experience, humanizing the student experience, but also humanizing, honestly, the teaching experience as well. One of the major challenges in remote learning is the sense of isolation that staff and students feel. In our roles as lecturers, it's critical that we humanize the student remote learning experience. That means that where it is possible, you make your presence felt. You can offer feedback um, on blogs or forums. You can acknowledge students' input and questions and responses. However, if you have a large class, responding to each student individually would be difficult. But perhaps you can use your tutors in this context to enhance or increase the sense of uh, lecturer presence or tutor presence. But if you don't have um, a group of tutors that you can you can draw on in this way, it would be worth having a conversation with your students about how often you can respond and when you will be doing so. Again, establish a clear protocol so that students know when you're going to be there. Consider ways of amplifying student voices in terms of just humanizing the experience. So if you can draw on students' responses or perspectives, that's a really useful tool. Some students really like seeing their names being mentioned, um, and others find it a little bit intimidating. So it would be worth potentially looking, asking your students through something like a poll at the beginning of the process, what would they prefer? Finally, consider creating an informal chat space. Um, it could be a bullet chat room. Um, it could be a channel in MS Teams. Your students have access to that as well. I would consider advising students that this is not a space that you will regularly visit, but that it's a space where they can chat about issues, kind of chat to each other um, more, and that if they want something specific, they come to you directly via an email. So on the next few slides, we've got two examples of communications from staff to students. The first one is a communication from um, a lecturer just right at the beginning of the COVID-19 process explaining what was going on and what she knew at that point in time. The second is a slightly longer text but again doing something very similar and what I would encourage you to do is to take your time and have a look at these two options and just figure out if there's anything in them that resonates for you in terms of how you might communicate with your students. Finally, we'd like to just remind you that there are various resources available to you in the remote teaching page at SILT. Um, so that's www.silt.uct.ac.za um, and that you can find the remote teaching page via our main page and that you should consider following us on Twitter um, because that is uh, an additional space for uh, information that we will be disseminating. But for now, I'm going to pause and say
good luck with the substantial challenge ahead of us. Um, please feel free to contact us with any queries. You could also direct your queries to help at bula.uct.ac.za.